course, has to have some food for thought as well as food for the stomach. So we're going to move on to some, I think, uh, very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, first, I'd like to say that we're very pleased to have with us Bridgepoint Education's CEO, Andrew Clark. Mr. Clark founded Bridgepoint Education in 2004 and continues to lead the company in its efforts to advance learning. And today he's going to talk to us about some of the exciting developments at Bridgepoint. Following him, um, Josh Fishman, who uh, those of you uh, who were here this morning got to meet, will um, give us his insights into the top 10 higher ed trends. All right. Well, thank you, Jenny. And let me congratulate you. I know this is your uh, third year of uh, doing the Higher Ed Tech Summit, and what a successful year it is. You got lines down the hallway here, so very, very impressive. I want to uh, welcome everybody this afternoon. Uh, the lunch boxes you all have uh, have uh, been decorated with Thu's on the outside. Bridgepoint Education is actually the company behind Thu's. I'll tell you a little bit about Bridgepoint and then what why we're doing Thu's and, and how, uh, how that all fits into how we believe uh, we can help define the uh, modern college experience uh, for uh, working adult students. So Bridgepoint Education I founded back in 2004 um, and that was really just an entrepreneurial, uh, just short of you know getting started in a garage kind of thing where we were whiteboarding and trying to figure out how to make college education more affordable, how we could innovate, make it more uh, quality education, more affordable, more accessible to more Americans, because we felt the people were getting priced out of the opportunity. So finally, uh, in 2004, there weren't a lot of people that, uh, at the time, you know, were thinking about online education, even doing online education. Uh, and now, today, we find ourselves where one in five uh, college students in the United States takes at least one class online, and. It's uh, definitely becoming part of the lexicon uh, when people talk about uh, higher education and people's uh, ability to access it. So Bridgepoint now is a publicly traded company. Uh, we own and operate two universities, Ashford University and University of the Rockies. We have about um, uh, over, just over 90,000 students now uh, that uh, access their college degree through our two institutions. 99% uh, of those people online the average age of our student is uh, about 33, 34 years of age. Uh, they find themselves to be uh, a working uh, adult student with, with family, uh, family commitments, a job, all of those uh, different complications. And we at Bridgepoint wanted to find a way in which we could uh, access those people and, and try and hold down the cost of their education by leveraging technology. Just a few ways in which we've done that now is we find ourselves uh, kind of fast forward to 2012. Uh, we were the first public education company to provide our students with uh, access uh, uh, through, uh, through the um, a mobile uh, device uh, to their classroom. So University of the Rockies Mobile was, uh, gave our, all of our graduate students the ability to access their classroom, classroom and classroom discussions right from their mobile device. Of course, we expanded that to Ashford University um, as well and, and to our students there. Uh, we really want to try and position ourselves from Bridgepoint's perspective uh, at that intersection where I, and one of the reasons why I think besides Ginny's good work that this room is so full, which is that technology and education are, are intersecting and, uh, and creating a tremendous amount of uh, positive disruption uh, with regards to student learning and student outcomes. And we're trying to position ourselves right at that intersection. One of the ways in which we're doing that is with this new product, uh, Thu's, which uh, decorates your lunchbox. You can go down to uh, booth 3206, and you can actually see that product. It's a uh, digital learning platform, and it enables students to be able to go on and ha have a very personalized experience in terms of uh, uh, their uh, textbook, being able to digest that content. And it actually provides a social network within the textbook itself. So the student can personalize it. Every from uh, in every aspect in terms of note taking, annotations, um, but they also can uh, uh, be sharing that very same experience with uh, thousands of students all across the United States eventually. We're beta testing it right now with 500 students. Um, and we got the idea for that uh, by developing kind of Thu's 1.0 uh, 
uh, for our students at Ashford University. So we've already had about 70,000 students that have taken at least one course uh, uh, with this learning platform. Uh, proving out the, uh, several things, the, our ability to uh, have a dynamic platform that could scale, but also uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to demonstrate that really improving the student experience uh, led to um, better learning, which led, led to greater persistence and more students being successful at achieving the ultimate goal of getting a college education. And that's where we really see um, uh, technology uh, and, and education kind of intersecting is right, right there around the student experience, around student learning outcomes. If you think about um, what most college students do today, they go take a textbook um, for a particular biology class in their college campus and uh, the student doesn't really have any sense of how well they're doing relative to others. Professors don't know if the students even opened the textbook. Um, the institution doesn't know um, a variety of things and now uh, with regards to the textbook and now because of that platform, because of digital learning, there's this tremendous database underlying all of that that provides uh, data that uh, actually then uh, could be fed back to a student and a student would ultimately be able to say to themselves, okay, this is how I'm doing compared to uh, uh, everybody else who's taking the same biology class, not just at my institution, but at institutions throughout the United States. And then you could even go even a step further from that to predictive modeling so that a student would be able to say, okay, currently what I'm doing is kind of puts me in the 50th percentile, but maybe, you know, I, I'm a little more ambitious than that. I want to get to the 75th percentile, the 80th, the 90th. And that information can be fed directly back to the student. It's a very exciting time, I think, in all of higher education. I think uh, Bridgepoint Education plays, plays a role in it, and we hope to be uh, one of the leading uh, innovators with regards to technology and uh, in higher education. I think Thu's is one demonstration of uh, kind of who we are as a company and how important it is to us that we create a uh, dynamic learning experience for students that actually quantifiably improves that student learning, produces a better student, uh, and of course, the ultimate goal. If we can produce better students in this country, we can continue to be more and more competitive uh, as we compete out there against other countries um, that have, uh, have invested heavily themselves in educating their population. We also have uh, Waypoint Outcomes is another component of Bridgepoint, and Waypoint is actually an assessment tool used by about 40 different institutions. Uh, Drexel's used it the longest for about seven years where faculty are able to build a rubrics and collect the, uh, the data from every single student paper. They're able to give the student immediate feedback on that paper, but then the, uh, the software on the platform aggregates the data for the professor, provides that information uh, to the professor, and they can actually see how well their students are learning, and as they change curriculum uh, and tweak things, what, what can occur to improve student learning just within that class. Because it aggregates all the data across those uh, different, uh, different courses, it can actually roll up to the pr uh, particular professor, but beyond that, it can go to the dean, eventually the provost, can be used on an institutional basis. Uh, so there's a variety of ways at Bridgepoint in which we're um, trying to change uh, the college experience, the modern college experience. We're trying to find, you know, I think the bottom line here is from a Bridgepoint perspective is to, to find innovative solutions that ultimately advance learning. That is our goal. So thank you everybody for your time today. I hope you enjoy. I know that Josh has got, uh, got a great uh, uh, list uh, that he's going to share with us of, uh, of trends in tech and higher ed. So I'll turn the floor over to, uh, over to them. But uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us today. And thanks again, Bridgepoint, for, for the lunch. We really appreciate it. I just wanted to remind everybody you should have had uh, this on your chair. It's for a reception immediately following um, higher ed tech. It's walking distance at the Renaissance Hotel. Give everybody a chance to, to really network. Um, what can I say? David Letterman, eat your heart out. We've got Josh Fishman here to give us his top 10 higher ed trends. Hey, how you doing? 
a little chilly in here, isn't it? <laughs> it's like they suddenly decided that there are hundreds of us and they needed to air condition the place. Well, um, I will try and keep you warm. Um, I'm Josh. I'm a senior writer for science and technology with the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, a publication which in its archaic form is stuck in your tote bags. Um, take a look at it, just really because I wrote the lead story and the issue that's in there, um, and it would make me feel better. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today were the things that I see happening in technology today that will happen in technology tomorrow, and I'm going to start out by talking about possible futures for higher education and technology. And if you just bear with me a second while I get my own notes in order. So one view of technology in higher ed is that it's kind of going to be a utopia, that there are going to be flowers and chirping birds, and student graduation rates are going to go way, way up, which will make Jim Applegate from the Lumina Foundation very happy, as well as lots of parents. Um, costs are going to come down. And the economy, because of all this, is going to turn around and my 401k is going to start looking a lot better. Um, <clears throat> there is, however, another view um, <coughs> that robots will teach and students won't learn, that China will make these robots and buy our colleges with the proceeds, that online degrees will be cheap and worthless. Um, and I think the third guy from the left was the governor of California <laughs> with an unsuccessful higher education policy. Um, and the truth is that nobody knows. These are predictions. You can place your bets. Um, and I'm kind of interested in what you guys think. And so we're going to use a little bit of educational technology to find out. On your chairs, if the light stayed on, you'll, you should find these white uh, clicker devices. Um, and uh, thoughtfully provided to us by iClicker. And um, I'm going to ask you to vote on what you think the future of higher ed is going to look like through technology. Um, if you turn them on, that's the bottommost button. And then start voting if, A, you think that technology in higher education will produce a soulless future with teaching robots, or B, will create spectacular academic success. There is no C. It's a binary. This is a technology meeting, ones and zeros. Um, and we'll come back to this later on, but voting is now closed, and the answer is, hmm, <laughs> bunch of technology optimists and a couple of people wanted C anyway. I like that. All right. Well. There are a couple of things that we do understand that are happening with higher education and technology. Number one is that the number of students who learn online has tripled. It's now huge. And early last year, the Chronicle polled the CEOs of colleges and universities, the presidents, about what they think is going to happen in the future. And we asked them to look out 10 years in the future. And you can see that um, they're kind of bullish on what's and on at least the rate of participation in online learning. That um, you know these number of students now are in the single digits for the most part, but in ten years, um, at two-year colleges, both private and public, sixty-five percent of students are going to take online classes. Um, you know, the lowest is 37 um, percent. But we were very curious as to about the quality issue. And so we asked this question. 
Dear Mr. President, how good is an online class? And overall, you can see that they were actually split. And when you dive into the details a little bit, you can see that those who are most positive about online technology and its value are those at two-year colleges, um, those who are the most reticent about it and have the most misgivings are at four-year privates. Um, and the one thing that I don't understand is the almost even split between the heads of for-profit colleges who are the ones who teach the most online courses. So maybe somebody afterwards can explain that to me. And um, that's the background. And this is what I've seen over the past 12 months that I think is going to continue over the next several months, next 12 months, and is going to start making things happen in 2012. So, number 10, tech trend is cheating. There is an arms race with cheating because 25 100 colleges now use Turnitin, which is software that professors can use to check their students' papers for plagiarism. Um, but they've also rolled out another program called WriteCheck, where um, students can check their own papers for plagiarism. And so now, you know, are the students kind of running it through, are the students plagiarizing passages, doing cut and paste from Wikipedia, and then just changing them enough, keep running them through WriteCheck? until it signals that it's not plagiarized and then they're turning it in because it's essentially the same software. Um, there's another bit of software that's out there called TinEye, which does the same sort of thing if you're taking an art course for images. Um, those clickers that you have in your hand, this is a very cute story. Um, a lot of professors are using those to do polls in class, like I'm doing now and they will grade students on participation and their answers to the polls. And what a number of professors have noticed is that a couple of, you know, a couple of students will, turn, will walk in the door with maybe four or five clickers because three or four of their buddies are sleeping back at the dorm. So, That's upsetting a number of people. Uh, by the way, the best advice um, that I've heard for dealing with that is don't make those clicker questions count for a lot of the grade, and you won't have people doing goofy things like that. Um, number nine, badges and games. You've heard a little bit about that already today. Um, but um, what have we got here? We've got MIT's Open Study. It gives badges to students who give the best answers to online discussions. Um, Mozilla, the people behind a lot of people's favorite browser, Firefox, is developing a way to let anyone who has a web page issue badges for content mastery. Um, and we've heard from uh, Grocket about gamification and how students are really taking on for that. Um, and so these things are going to go on to resumes, and we're going to see whether employers actually count them as much as a degree from, say, MIT. Um, the next one is community colleges get connected. Um, community colleges have been the poor stepchild of the digital revolution. They've been out in areas where there haven't been a lot of cable companies willing to run provide, willing to run wires out there. Um, but um, earlier this year, because of some stimulus money in West Virginia, for example, they've actually been able to extend wireless out to New River and some very rural communities. And the state as a whole is going from I, basically ranking in the bottom five for wireless connections and wired connections to the top five. 
And as a result, these community colleges can now offer online courses, which if you think about it is a big deal because they're the ones who are dealing with the non-traditional learners that we've been hearing about, the people who have jobs who can't make it to campus and who actually can make it to an online class if the college had enough bandwidth to offer it. Number seven, cost consciousness. So we've been hearing a lot about cost drivers. At Washington State, they decided that cost, course materials in courses were just costing way, way too much, and they're starting to take action about it. And so they just set a $30 limit. This picture of Cable Green, who's now um, gone even lower than $30. He's working for Creative Commons, which is an organization that tries to uh, provide ways of licensing content for free or next to free. Um, speaking of free, and we're next to free, we heard a lot about trend number six, which is learning management systems and other kinds of software that for-profit companies are offering as loss leaders, that professors, students can get open class, they can get Blackboard's course sites, and professors can use those to structure their classes. They come with grade books. Um, they come with very good reviews from the people who use them. And they may be wedges for which these companies that are going to be able to take the captive audience that they have in students and then provide them other stuff using these platforms which they might have to pay for. Trend number six, mobile devices. So let me catch up on my notes. You may have seen some mobile devices here. Um, a lot of people have them. Um, the number of percentage of colleges that now have mobile web platforms just in the first half of this year doubled. Um, and I don't know what happened, I'm sorry, the first half of 2011 doubled. I don't know what happened in the last half of 2011. But it's going up like a rocket. Um, and just about every software company that's offering content that you've heard about today now has a mobile platform or an app. Trend number four is analytics and adaptive learning. And the big news in this space was that Newton, who will be um, talking to us in a bit, um, made a deal with Pearson um, to power its MyLabs courses, which are used by millions of students. And Newton's engines can or software engines can figure out how much time a student spends on each module of a course, each concept of a course, whether they learn better and perform better on tests and retests, if they get video added on, or if they get um, additional notes added on. Um, and so analytics is going to be big because it's going to tell colleges what kinds of teaching approaches result in the best learning, something that they really haven't been that on top of. Number three, blended courses. Um, for institutions that you really wouldn't think would be interested in online education. This is a picture of the campus of Bryn Mawr College. There are 25 other liberal arts institutions of the ilk of Bryn Mawr who are participating in an experiment to see if they can bring, if they can use Carnegie Mellon's open learning initiative courses to bring blended learning into their campuses. And these are colleges that boast an eight to one faculty student ratio and the and 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 tout the closeness of the instructor student relationship as a major benefit. So what are they doing with cognitive tutors and putting people in front of screens? What they're doing is they're taking their entry level classes and they're extending the reach of their students, of the of excuse me, of their teachers 
And what the instructors say is that what this allows them to do is get away from spending a lot of their time giving their standard lectures and walk around from student to student and give them individualized help and have individualized discussions. Number two, credit at traditional colleges. MIT X was mentioned earlier today. So MIT has been giving away its content through open courseware forever, about 20 years now. Everybody loves the idea. Everybody hates the idea that they're going to spend a lot of time watching these lectures and trying to absorb this content, and it's not going to get them anything that they can show the rest of the world, like a potential employer. So now MIT is rolling out MIT X, which is going to allow people to do exactly this, and they're going to get a certificate of completion. And it's going to be very interesting to see if this is going to result in more acceptance of these kinds of credits. And the number one tech trend is the rise of non-traditional colleges. Khan Academy. Khan Academy, run by a guy named Salman Khan, who's put up 2,500 videos, has had 4 million users in November. Uh, they struck a deal with No, the textbook publisher, which has hundreds of major publisher textbooks. And now they've added on-demand links to those interactive textbooks that go right to Khan Academy videos. And that is going to be added value for that proposition. The University of the People, which offers free online courses, got New York University to accept transfer students. Western Governors University, which you've also heard about today, has now started expanding and aggressively marketing its competency-based education um, with Western Governors in Texas and Indiana, and I think I'm leaving out a couple of states. And so this is now going to join the panoply of arrows pointing at traditional college education saying, we think you need to start doing things differently. So given all that, I'm now curious what you think technology will do to higher education. A, produce a soulless future with teaching robots, or B, create spectacular academic success. Pick up your little white clickers, start to vote. You only have two choices. It shouldn't take that long. You should be done by the time I'm speaking. I've stopped speaking. And the results are <laughs> you know, it's interesting that C, D, and E seem to be taking votes away from spectacular academic success and not so much from the soulless future with teaching robots. So I think that that means you guys are pragmatists and think that there's going to be something in the middle there. Thank you very much. Well, I love the title of, of this session, Take Two Tablets and Call Me in the Morning. Uh, and you'll find out at the end of Joanne's presentation why. Uh, join me in welcoming Joanne Spica, Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Copia in Interactive. And we want to thank Copia for sponsoring the high tech giveaway that will follow Joanne's presentation. Thank you, Ginny. Thank you, everyone. I just want to say thanks for giving us the opportunity. I will actually be very brief, and I come bearing gifts. So. <laughs> That's, that's like the best part of the show, right? Um, but anyway, I really just wanted to take a couple of minutes and introduce some new technology to you, brought to you by Copia and DMC Worldwide. And just a quick introduction of the platform that we offer. It's a unified solution for professors and students 
to be able to access all of their digital materials for their courses as well as experience um, study groups and sessions 24-7, as well as other content that is important to them in the rest of their campus lives. So behind me, you will see just a few screenshots, and it's just really a glimpse of what Copia has to offer. And since my time is limited today, I'm just jumping right in and sharing the highlights with you and would like to invite you to join us at our booth for an in-depth presentation for everything that Copia is, uh, is offering today. But I do want to share with you that currently, Copia is the choice for over a 1,000 college campuses nationwide with access to more than 6 million students. What makes our offering unique and very different is it's a, it's a non-fragmented experience, as I mentioned, where students have access to not only their digital course materials, but their leisure reading materials, um, other digital content including music, magazines, and much more coming to the platform. But the real, really unique opportunity that Copia brings to this marketplace is the branded solution with a built-in social community so that students are familiar with their own community. If there's one thing we learned from Facebook, it's that students in this particular demographic love to be connected and they love to be connected 24-7 and interacting and sharing everything that they're doing. So think about a, a solution that's branded to the community with a built-in social network where they can read digitally online. Our reader allows the students and professors to interact 24-7, offering real-time annotations and notes within the margins of the books. Um, again, if there's anything Facebook taught us, it's that we like to be uh, t connected with our friends 24-7. Um, through our direct partnerships and our aggregator partnerships, we have a catalog of over 15,000 digital textbook titles today, along with millions of general reading titles, magazines and music, and um, other gaming fun things that are coming to the platform. So again, our unique offering is that non-fragmented experience where the students and professors can interact at their own pace, at their own time, have access to all of their digital content and their social community all in one platform, in one experience. Um, the, um, the other unique offering about Copia is that we are digital across all, um, or we are accessible across all digital touch points. So imagine that you're working in a particular textbook or you're working in a particular classroom experience and you're taking notes within your book, you're friends with the smartest person in the class who's taking really great notes, you're cramming for a test, you're running to class, you can actually view your notes on your mobile phone without ever opening the pages of the book. So the Copia platform branded solution is accessible across all digital touch points. We also offer very innovative solutions like our recently launched program where with a one single touch we offer professors and students access to all of their digital materials. So a student comes into class, works with the professor, opens their device, whatever their device of choice is, and they have access preloaded in their libraries, broken down for them by cohort, um, all of the books, digital reading materials that they need for that particular class. So um, again, just a very unique offering. So there's a lot of things that I could share with you. Um, this is just a glimpse. Again, we can offer quick demos or, or in-depth demos in our booth, since my time is so limited. Um, but access to study groups 24-7, this is just a glimpse of what the platform looks like, and you can see that it is branded to the Stanford University. Again, um, please visit us at our booth. We're in Central Hall, 11612. And um, again, I just want to thank you so much for your time. And if everyone will take a look under their chair, you might actually find one of these, because we are in Vegas after all, so you get some poker chips. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>